In the bustling city of Philippi, amidst the backdrop of Roman power and culture, a letter was written that would transcend time and place, carrying profound spiritual truths and a call to joy and unity in Christ. Today, we delve into the opening verses of Paul's letter to the Philippians, a letter saturated with the gospel message and marked by a fervent plea for believers to stand together in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. We begin in verse 1, where we read Paul's opening greeting. He says, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ, Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. Paul begins this letter with a humble declaration of his identity as a bond servant of Jesus Christ. It's important to note that this isn't a mere formality. Rather, it sets the tone for the entire letter. Paul, once a persecutor of the church, now proudly identifies himself as a servant of the very one he sought to persecute. It is a testament to the transformative power of the gospel. As we reflect on this, let us also acknowledge the implications for us today. We too are called to be bondservants of Jesus Christ, willingly submitting ourselves to his lordship just as Paul did. We must surrender our wills, ambitions, and desires to him, recognizing that our highest calling is to serve him faithfully. Paul's audience is addressed as saints in Christ Jesus. This designation carries a profound theological significance. The term saints does not refer to a select few who have achieved extraordinary holiness, but to all believers in Christ. In Christ, we are sanctified and set apart for his purposes. We are positionally holy, not because of our merits, but because of Christ's work on the cross. In light of this truth, we must rid ourselves of the misconception that sainthood is reserved for a spiritual elite. Instead, let us embrace the reality that in Christ, we are all saints. This should lead to a deep sense of humility and gratitude, for it is solely by God's grace that we are called saints. Furthermore, the mention of bishops and deacons serves as a reminder of the structure within the church. Bishops, or overseers, are entrusted with the spiritual leadership and care of the congregation, while deacons are appointed to serve in practical ways. This structure is essential for the health and order of the church, ensuring that both spiritual and practical needs are met. As we apply this to our context today, we must recognize the importance of leadership within the church. The leaders, like Paul and Timothy, are to be servants of Christ, leading with humility and a heart of service. Congregants, on the other hand, are called to honor and submit to the leadership appointed by God, recognizing the vital role they play in shepherding the flock. Paul continues in verse 2, Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's customary greeting, grace to you and peace, is not a mere polite wish for well-being. It is a profound declaration of the gospel. Grace, the unmerited favor of God, is the foundation upon which peace is built. This grace and peace flow from the divine source, God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The grace Paul speaks of is not a passive concept. It is the dynamic, transformative power of God. It is through God's grace that we are saved, justified, and sanctified. It is the grace of God that empowers us to live the Christian life and pursue holiness. As believers, we must continually draw from the wellspring of God's grace. It is by His grace that we are forgiven when we fall, strengthened when we are weak, and sustained in our journey of faith. We should never seek to earn God's favor through our efforts, for it is freely given through Christ. Additionally, the peace mentioned here is not the absence of conflict or turmoil in our lives, but a deep, abiding sense of well-being that transcends circumstances. It is the peace that comes from knowing that through Christ, 
we have been reconciled with God and have eternal hope. In a world filled with chaos and uncertainty, this peace becomes a source of unwavering stability. The unity of grace and peace from both God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ underscores the essential doctrine of the Trinity. It reminds us that the Father and the Son are one in purpose and essence. In the Gospel, we encounter the triune God working in perfect harmony to bring about our redemption. As we conclude this exposition of Philippians chapter 1 verses 1 and 2, we are reminded of the richness and depth of the gospel message contained within these two simple verses. Paul's identity as a bond servant of Christ, the recognition of all believers as saints, and the greeting of grace and peace from God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, all point to the central truth of our faith, the gospel. In a world that often seeks to divide and fragment, the letter to the Philippians calls us to unity in Christ. It urges us to stand together as one body, one family, and one community of faith, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. The gospel is not just a message for personal salvation, it is a call to be transformed and to live out our faith in a way that brings glory to God and impacts the world around us. Let us, therefore, take to heart the lessons from these opening verses. Let us embrace our identity as bond servants of Jesus Christ, recognizing the privilege and responsibility that come with it. Let us also remember that in Christ we are all saints, and this should lead us to humility and gratitude. Finally, may we daily draw from the wellspring of God's grace and experience the profound peace that comes from knowing Him. As we do so, we will find the strength and unity we need to live out the gospel in a world desperately in need of its transforming power. The message of Philippians is a call to joy, unity, and gospel-centered living. May it resonate in our hearts and lives today.